So, thank you very much for the organizer, I should say, for organizing this fantastic uh, conference. Uh, enjoying it very much and very happy to present the paper and be on the program. So this is a joint work with Eric Gilje and Todd Gormley. Um, Eric is my colleague at Wharton and Todd is from WashU. Okay, so it seems there is a growing sense among academics, practitioners, and basically everyone that uh, common ownership is on the rise. And when we say common ownership, we really mean situations where two firms are at least partially owned by the same um, investors. And if you look at the S&P 500, for example, um, almost all of the firms there have BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, and others as main investors. And if you sum it up, it's become quite significant. Okay? So why do we care about it? It's actually a fairly old economic idea. Common owners would have incentives to internalize externalities that firms might impose on each other. So if it's a product market competitions, and prices, there is a price competition, they have incentives to internalize that. But you can think of other types of externalities that might show up. And indeed, recently, there is more and more evidence suggesting that common ownership has some effect. It could be on emergent acquisition, corporate governance, CEO pay. And I think the um, most famous one is anti-competitive behavior. right? And that gives a little bit of an angle, kind of negative angle to the effect of common ownership. But the general principle is that there are some externalities, regardless of the benefits or cost to societies, common investors have incentives to internalize them, potentially, and thereby affect firms' policies. So some have suggested that maybe we need to kind of rethink how we maybe regulate or just in general think about what these common owners might be doing. So what we try to do in this paper is uh, maybe take a step back and say, well, if you really want to understand um, the effect of common ownership, it's important potentially to know what are the determinants of that. Um, some have suggested that it could be index investment that is on the rise, definitely. And if so, you know, that's something we really want to know. But maybe there are other determinants. And more importantly, even if it's index or something else, how are we going to quantify that? How are we going to measure, in particular, the effect of common ownerships on incentives to internalize these externalities? We care about, and we should care about, common ownership to the extent it has real effect. So it's really important to understand whether it can affect um, incentives. OK, but measuring is not a trivial, uh, measuring incentives is not a trivial task. So here is a very simple example. You have two institutions. One owns 5% in firm A, another 5% in firm B. The other one owns 1% 1 in firm A and 20% in the other firm. And now there is a question, for example, what is the common ownership, however you want to think about it, of each of these institutions? Sounds pretty straightforward when you own 5% in both firms. Slightly less straightforward if you own 1% in firm A and 20% in the others. What about aggregation? How should we aggregate the common ownerships when we have more than one common owners? It's not obvious. And most importantly, what is going to be the impact on incentives, right? So what we're going to do, what we do in this paper, what I will talk about today briefly, um, we're basically going to discuss briefly some naive, naive measures of overlap. So we're going to distinguish between overlap of the shareholder base. And, um, and then we're going to propose a model-driven measure of common ownership where the emphasis is going to be on the effects of managers' incentives to um, uh, change from policy as a consequence of this common ownership. Okay? So, um, and finally, we're going to take it to the data. Okay? So I'm going to show you some, some numbers. Okay, so here is some notation, just to make sure we speak the same language. There is not going to be too much math here. I'm going to denote uh, alpha i n is basically the ownerships of investor i in firm n. Beta i n is going to be the way that firm n is getting in the investor's portfolio. Um, v n just going to be firm value, and i a b just a set of common ownerships. All of these investors who have some ownerships in both firms, a and b. Okay. So um, here is a few measures which you can come up with um, about overlap of the shareholders base. Now I say you can come up with because basically there is no theory behind them, right? The most intuitive one you can start with basically counting how many investors hold both hold shares both in firm A and firm B. Of course, the problem is that you might count many investors who own very tiny amounts in either of these firms or both. So you can put some weight on that, right? You can sum up the number of owners, but then weight it by, let's say, the minimum 
of the ownership that they have. I'm not sure why minimum is necessarily the right thing to do, but that's one way to go about it. You can alternatively try to take some weighted average where the average is based on market cap. This has been used by a JF papers and by uh, there's a couple of follow-up papers on that. And, and, and I, I think we can all agree that to some extent these measures captures the overlap in the ownerships between these two firms. But we would argue it's not at all clear whether they captures in any meaningful way the incentives of managers of these firms or the investors in these firms to internalize externalities. And that, that's the thing I think, I think going to be basically the main contribution of the paper is to come up with a new measure which is model driven and then try to take it to the data and perhaps say something meaningful. Okay? So I will refer to the paper for the details and the math. It's not that complicated, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to lay out, um, try to argue that the underlying assumptions of these models are quite intuitive and they give us something which is measurable, which is the objective. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first assumption is that managers care about the support they get from the shareholders. Now, when I say they care about the support, of, the support from shareholders, it's not because they're necessarily benevolent and just born with the incentives to maximize shareholders' value. They have some trade-off between their own private benefit and uh, making sure that shareholders are happy, maybe because otherwise there's going to be enough discontent to remove them from office. Okay? So, in some sense, managers will care about keeping their shareholders happy. The second assumption, well, if you want to think about the real effect of common ownership, then we're going to assume that corporate policy of firm A is going to have an effect on the valuation of other firm. Another way to say it, there are externalities. Okay? Now, in the paper, we have a fairly general um, 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 set up of externalities, we allow for different kind of externalities, um, but we are abstracting to a large extent from different, I would call it strategic interactions that could complicate things. Okay, so again, I'll refer to the papers. It's fairly general, but um, there are still some assumptions that guide it. Externalities are important. Okay, the third assumption is that investors, institutional investors or others, when they make decision whether or not they like the particular managers, they think about the effect of his actions or their entire portfolio. Okay, they, are not, they don't have this main accounting where they, oh, I'm invested in Google, therefore I only care about how decisions of Google's management affecting uh, the Google share value. Maybe it has externalities and therefore I will care about how it's affect other portfolio companies. And that's an assumption that it shows by other measures, which I will get, I will get to the MHHI, the modified HHI. And the final assumption, which is probably the most important one, is that investors have some limited attention, okay? And they are going to pay more attention to firms which contribute more to their portfolio, okay? So you are going to pay more attention, you're going to be more informed, and therefore, you will support management, you're more likely to support management if he's doing the right thing for your portfolios. And managers, in some sense, are going to be aware of that. They will understand who are their investors for, for which um, their companies contribute more to their portfolios. Okay? So, investors will, so managers will take that into account. This is where managers are not going to be perfectly benevolent in the sense that, well, if investors are uninformed, they will put kind of more weight on their own private benefits, if you will. So these are the main, um, um, basically, assumptions that we are going to work with. And based on, or in this framework, we are going to define the effect of common ownerships on incentives as follows. So we're going to look at two firms, firm A and B, right? And we're going to ask, well, what is the effect on the incentive of the manager of firm A? And the effect is going to be measured as how this incentive to take a particular corporate policy is going to change where all the common owners of firm A and firm B are going to divest their holdings in firm B and reinvest it in something like a T-bills, okay? So they keep the portfolio proportions constant, okay? So again, our measure is going to be how common ownerships affect incentives, the marginal change in the incentive of manager to take corporate actions. So we do that, there is some math in the papers and we get with this um, measure, which we call GGL, you can guess why. Um, but basically, it's um, a very simple construct, which we think can be taken to the data. And I want to explain the intuition and basically what is, what is going on here. So what you see here is basically summation of across all the investors, 
um, that we have um, um, in this particular setup. Um, and you basically, um, you sum the product of the ownerships in firm A, some monotone function of uh, basically the weight that this firm is having in the investor portfolio and the ownerships in firm B. So what is the intuition? Well, the effect of common ownerships on incentives is going to be larger when the common owners has more ownerships in firm A because then the managers of firm A will care more about getting support from this particular investor. That's very intuitive. It will also increase with the weight that this firm is getting in the investor's portfolio because that investor is more likely to be informed and therefore when managers are taking decisions, they will put more weight on their informed shareholder base. And finally, it's going to increase with the ownerships of the common investors in firm B, the other firms, because if you own more of the other firms, then you care more about the externalities that firm A is imposing on firm B. Okay? So that's basically the intuition behind these measures. So I want to make a couple of comments. The first one is that this is bidirectional measures. That is, the effect of common ownership and incentives uh, between A and B on firm A could be different from the one on firm B. And you can see it here from the formula because the way that firm A is getting in the investor's portfolio could be different from firm B. The second point which is important is that notice that in this measure, there is nothing about externalities, right? So if you actually look at the paper, we have these externalities. These are kind of the deltas there. And we derive these measures, you have kind of um, something which you can basically multiply here, which is the effect of externalities. But we drop that. So the best way to think about our measure is the effect of common ownerships per unit of externalities. And we do it intentionally, partly because it's very hard to observe these externalities. So we want to have a measure which doesn't rely on um, exactly how we quantify these externalities. So again, it's best, you should, you should think about it as uh, effect of common ownership on incentives per unit of externalities. And finally, I'm going to argue it's a fairly flexible measure. In what way? Well, for example, you can say, well, maybe managers should only care about the um, investors in their firm which have more than 5%. Or maybe they should care only about the largest five investors. So this can all be incorporated by some transformation of this, um, of, of the ownerships in firm A. Or maybe, um, maybe you, you can think of different uh, functional form of how investors pay attention as a function of how much weight um, investor, uh, how much way the company is getting in the investor portfolio. So we don't have a very strong um, or particular strong opinion on exactly what the shape of this function is going to be. We're going to start with some identity function. I should know that there is some empirical evidence by Ellie Fish and others that suggest that firms or investors tend to pay more attention and monitor more closely companies which contribute more to the portfolio. And there is also some theoretical analysis which support that. Diversified investors are going to be less informed. Okay, um, I basically say that, and also this. Okay, modified HHI, become very famous due to the forthcoming JF paper about the airline companies, um, even though it's a fairly uh, old idea. And I want to, I think it's important kind of to put the two measures in contrast. So I want to say a couple of things about the MHHI. Um, MHHI capture a very specific kind of externalities, right? The one which arise from oligopolistic competition, product market competition. Right? And that's fine. Um, our measure differ from that in the sense that, again, it's per unit of externalities and it's kind of generic. So maybe there are benefit and cost for that. Um, we think it's hard to measure externalities, so we want to keep it general. And potentially our measure can apply to other contexts. More importantly, every time you specialize, you make more assumptions. So if you actually read the theory behind MHHI, it makes assumptions about the nature of competition. There is an assumption about the solution concept, about the equilibrium, and all of that. These are fine. This could be a legitimate assumption. I'm just saying there is more structure into it. Our model is much more simplistic. We make less assumption to get our measures. And to get the MHHI, you need, for example, market share, okay, which may or may not be easy to measure and find. Our measure doesn't make any use of that. So these are um, a few differences. But maybe the most significant one which I want to highlight is that in our measure, investors are not, or in our model, investors are not fully attentive to what firms are doing, unlike in the MHHI, where there is an assumption that, well, for example, if BlackRock owns these two companies, right, in the airline industry, they're paying full attention to these, these companies, irrespective of the fact that they also own on basically every other companies in the, uh, in the universe or in, in the public markets in the US, okay? So this is where we are deferring. Many of the differences will be due to these two effects. 
Okay, so this is basically the measure, and the next thing we do, we basically take it um, to the to the data. So um, we're going to use the standards that are set, uh, Reuters, uh, Thomson Reuters 13F, matches with CompuStat, and creates over um, 30 years period. Um, we end up with a massive uh, data set, close to 400 billion observations, because we basically look at every year at all the possible pairs and calculate that measure. And actually, it's twice as large if you look at the our incentive measure because it's a bidirectional one. So every regression that any referee is going to ask us to do is going to take us some time. Okay? So keep that in mind if someone here is going to be a referee. Okay. Um, so here is the first kind of interesting plot, which is we simply look at um, over time, over this data, um, over this sample period, um, what happens to what we propose as potentially overlap measures. Um, and you can see that they increased by a factor of close to 20 in the last 30 years. I think that's something which all of us kind of had a strong feeling uh, that is happening. And then you can compare it with our measures, GGL, and you can see it's a much more modest increase, only by a factor of three, roughly comparable with the increase in institutional ownership in that period of time. Okay? So why is the difference? Well, largely it's going to come from this beta that we have in our measure. The fact that if you are going to have maybe more index investing potentially, it also implies that the companies on average are going to be less important for each investors who owns them. Okay, so the next thing we do to basically better understand um, the association or correlation between the GGL measure, um, the incentive measure, and, um, and potential determinants, we run the following regressions. Uh, it's a pair level regression, so Y is going to be the overlap of the GGL measure of pair I in year T. And we're going to regress that on a potential determinant. I should be, um, I should be clear, and my two co-authors were very careful in process. Every paper they ever wrote is a very careful identification that we are not attempting to give any causal interpretation for this. This is purely correlation or within pair correlation. Uh, we think it's an interesting and important first step. So uh, any interpretation we'll give it will not necessarily be a causal one. Um, so we have a bunch of determinants. Uh, we have some pair level fixed effect, U fixed effect, and we cluster around um, some of those around pair level. There are some issues with that. Hopefully we'll be able to sort it out. Okay, so, um, well, we're going to, one of the determinants we're going to focus at um, is going to be index. Uh, so we're going to create a bunch of indicators. For example, um, you get indicator one if two companies are in the S&P 500, okay, or in the Russell 2000 and so on. Why we do it? Because people seem to think that indexing has a lot to do with common ownership. We tend to agree. Okay, so here is the first um, regressions. We're basically going to regress mean overlap on, um, on uh, this indexing index uh, indicators and a bunch of other control. By the way, we do the same for the other overlap measures. You get very similar results. Uh, we control for institutional ownership, style control, for example, um, size, how different the firms in size, dividend policy, and so on. Um, and what you can see here, as you might expect, there is a positive loading of these overlap measures on index inclusions. Two firms are in the same index are likely to have more overlap in the shareholder base. That's very intuitive. It's also economically meaningful, and it's true across all different indexes that we looked at. Okay? That's something you would expect. Maybe the punchline is the following. We do the same for our incentive measure, right? the GGL. There is one difference, which is now we have a pair direction fixed effect, if you can try to you know, imagine what it means. Um, but here what is interesting, you can see that the effect or the loading on index inclusion is more complex. It's positive on some and negative on others. You can see here it's negative on the Russell 2000. And again, it's economically, it's quite meaningful. Okay? So in other words, to interpret this negative coefficient is to say, well, it's not true necessarily that there is this positive association between two firms being in the same index and common ownership has necessarily stronger incentives uh, or has a stronger impact on the incentives of managers to internalize externalities, whatever that might be. Okay? And the intuition, we think, is quite simple, right? It just comes out of the model. Well, indexing has the clear effect of increasing the overlap in the shareholder base, right? Because if you're in the same index, then all of these investors who follow this index are going to own you more overlap. But at the same time, it could be that these investors are more diversified, and therefore, 
Again, each company um, contributes less to their portfolio. That implies that these investors might pay less attention, and therefore the effect on incentives is going to be, um, um, the, the effect of common ownership on incentives is going to be smaller. So again, that's, I don't want to make it sound, even though it does as a causal interpretation, because there could be reverse causality, omitted variables, and all of that. That's the reason why it's potentially important to understand the determinants of, of uh, common ownership. Okay, so um, just before I conclude, we have a bunch of things on my, our to-do list is to calculate different, measure, different versions of that measure. For example, looking at only those for, uh, aggregating it only across investors who own at least 5%. It seems to be done in the existing literature. For whatever reason, 5% is, seems to be the relevant threshold. We think it's worthwhile doing. Um, we are going to something which our model doesn't really uh, give guidance, but we think of breaking it up to a passive measure of common ownerships and an active passive man, we're going to put a large asset managers, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, and the, and the active one is basically going to be uh, looking at all the edge fund activists, right? And, and basically um, using them in the 30 and F. We're going to use our own Brav's um, data set for that. And, and hopefully interesting things will show up in these two different uh, measures. And finally, we plan to validate our measures, for example, trying to see whether it has any predictive power whatsoever on, um, for example, the likelihood that two firms in the same industries are going to be merged or creating some supplier-client relationship and so on. Again, our model is kind of agnostic about where these externalities are coming from, so clearly this measure should be more relevant only when you think these externalities are there. So just to uh, wrap up, we think it's very interesting, very important topic, what is the effect of common ownership? But it's interesting because we think it, um, you know, it incentivizes firms, whatever the mechanism is, to um, internalize this, this externality. So it's important to come up with a measure which tries or attempts to capture those incentives. That's what we do. Uh, we plan to post, uh, make it public, the, the measure, and we hope other people will follow and try to use it and test other theories or see where it's relevant. Um, if I have to summarize, what is the main point is that the overlap in the shoulder base is kind of necessary for common ownership to have any effect, but it's not sufficient, right? You have to have the incentives of the managers or the investors, and our measure partially captures that. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you uh, so much, Elaine and Marco and Vanessa for... Uh putting on the conference and for inviting me along, and uh, to Doran for a great paper. Uh, so I just want to begin the broad themes of this paper. Basically, uh, does common ownership by institutional investors across corporations that are in the same economic sector uh, result in anti-competitive outcomes on the basis that it encourages corporate managers uh, to engage in antitrust activities, uh, and that these may have an effect on the quality and the price of goods. So uh, prices go up in the airline industry. You know, every time we buy an airline ticket, it's going to be higher because everybody across the industry is higher, uh, and that workers are paid less. Uh, the other major theme in the paper is, uh, does the increasing popularity of index funds contribute to common ownership, and if so, how much, and what's the impact of that? The background common ownership uh, debate assumes uh, that it has a great deal to do with it and uh, that it has important regulatory consequences in all sorts of corporate governance areas. So, for example, M&A, executive compensation and stakeholder interests. So that's what the paper's about. Um, this is a topic that has species jumped from economics into the legal area. And uh, legal literature has, in recent times, talk ab talked about it as this economic blockbuster. And that came about as a result of a Harvard uh, Law Review article in 2016 by Professor Elhag. Uh, and he said this is something that everyone needs to be paying attention to, that this small group of institutions has acquired these huge shareholdings, well, not huge, each one, but collated, quite huge, across horizontal competitors, and that the result of that is everyone is competing less vigorously. America is not being made great. It's going down. Um, the primary culprits for this terrible uh, result 
are BlackRock, Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, Fidelity, and State Street Global, uh, our traditional uh, institutional investors. Another part of the literature, which is both by uh, economists and lawyers, uh, this is a paper by Posner, Morton, and Weil in 2016. They say that this is the great but mostly unknown antitrust story of our time, that we were sitting there thinking that we liked institutional investors holding stakes in our companies, but there is this gigantic antitrust story and it has only just come out. No one has ever thought about it before. Now, this blockbuster theory in the legal context at least is um, you know, big on impact, everyone's been electrified by it, you know, because who wants to pay $10 more for your air ticket? Uh, but on the other hand, it is sometimes short on fine tuning. And that is where I think that the uh, GGL paper is incredibly valuable because it really does bring this data-driven uh, much greater rigor to the debate. So the aims of the uh, GGL paper are these, uh, to construct measures to actually quantify the levels of common ownership, and they do this in this incredibly wide period, 30-year uh, period between 1980 and 2012, which is why you know, their data is so extensive. Then to me, uh, the really valuable, well, I, I think it's all valuable, but the second of these goals is very difficult, I think, but really important to basically have this measure to quantify what is the impact if you've got common ownership across an economic sector, how does that affect the managers of those companies? Um, because the common ownership theory, as it has come out in the legal literature, you know, often just assumes that it will affect those managers' incentives. Uh, but it needs to be measured. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. You know, there's many a slip twixt cup and lip, and that's what the theory says, but how is it, in fact, playing out in practice? That's where this paper is very important. And then finally, this connection between common ownership and index investing. Uh, index investing, it's been around since the 1970s. How has it driven common ownership that we have now got to this position? Now, I am, as many of you know, a lawyer, not a financial economist. And uh, so I'm not going to be basically making comments on uh, Doran's methodology. I'm going to be the ideal commentator. I'm going to say it all looks great. Um, I'm sure it's incredibly rigorous and I'm sure it proves your three goals up there. Um, but what I do want to bring to the debate is I want to try and contextualize um, this paper. And I want to shift it and make it a broader uh, focus and backdrop to show you why this common ownership debate is so electrifying in the legal context and why this paper is terribly important because it's not a debate that's going to be going away. It's going to be around for quite some time. And so I, I, I want to talk about where it fits in the last 30 or so years of developments in corporate governance. Uh, shifting ownership patterns, uh, the rise of institutional investors, and also I want to broaden the debate from US uh, economic sectors to looking at some global developments. So that's where I'm going with this contextualization. Uh, when Doran and I spoke at morning tea, I said, well, I'm not going to you know, have a go into your methodology. And he said, oh, well, it's really important. You know, we've got to speak the same language. So you speak your language. I'm, I think we may be you know, Seinfeld parallel universes, but I hope that you will see the connections between us here. So, um, some preliminary comments about the common ownership debate when I first came to it. When I was looking at this literature, it seemed to me that it slipped between three stories. And it seemed to me that the common ownership, uh, the original legal writers, often don't quite pinpoint which of these stories they're talking about. And so when I think about common ownership, I can think of at least three possible versions of it. Um, version one is this idea, well, my versions one and version two both focus on the incentives of the investors themselves and the fund managers. So, you know, why do they, what are their incentives going to be when they own across a wide spectrum? Diversified ownership in the same industry. 
So one possibility is they're just going to go, oh, well, you know, we own everything, so we're not going to adopt an owner-like stance with particular companies. Now, that's what was a very familiar debate and a very familiar position in the 1990s when, as we'll see, people first started being aware of the rise of institutional owners and the possible impact on corporate governance. This was the passivity story of the 1990s, and this was seen as a corporate governance problem. We want institutional investors to monitor. They're not going to be as good monitors because they're going to be spread too thin and they will not adopt an ownership stance in each of those companies where they, they own across a whole sector. Version two, the second possible story that you could take out is, well, if these institutional investors own across a whole sector, they might misuse their position to extract these private benefits because you know, they, they own competitors. Now, that is version two of the story uh, in the current common ownership debate with an overlay, this overlay that even passive institutional investors are really active. Posner, Morton and Weil in their 2016 article, I think they adopt this position that the institutional investors themselves, the fund managers themselves, are going to have these uh, negative antitrust-like incentives and it, both, pos both active and uh, passive investors will have those. And, you know, we can see this in version two. Uh, back in 1991, uh, Professor Richard Buxbaum, at this time of the rise of institutional investment, said a totally passive investor may be easier to accept than an active one. Well, not in Posner, Morton and Wiles' world because they believe that even passive investors are actually using their shareholdings and using those shareholder rights uh, to take active stances in terms of voting in directors, removing directors, voting on executive pay, etc. And so they use this quote from the Vanguard website uh, to show this where Vanguard basically says, we believe that our active engagement demonstrates that passive investors do not need to be passive owners. Um, passive doesn't really mean passive. So that's the second version, still focused on the investor's incentives. The third version of the background common ownership debate shifts the focus and focuses on the corporate managers of the investee companies. And this version of the debate says that those corporate managers are going to have reduced incentives to compete, whether or not the institutional investors are passive or active. Um, and irrespective of those institutional investors' conduct. So what this third version does is to leapfrog over version two and say, we're not particularly concerned with uh, the incentives and the conduct, passive or active, of the investors themselves. We're going to go to the corporate managers and they're going to intuit that those investors will have certain desired outcomes. Now, on that version three, which is a very extreme position in the legal literature, it does not matter that the financial interests are minority interests that the institutional investors hold. It does not matter, as I said, that those institutional investors are passive because, hey, no one's passive in this world. Even the passive ones are actually active. It doesn't matter that those institutional investors have made no attempt to uh, you know, collaborate or to have dialogue or communicate with the investee companies although Professor Elhug says that normally will be the case and I think is a growing pattern, um, and then doesn't need to be any coordination between the institutional investors either. So none of those things are necessary. In the legal literature, it just says that those uh, investee companies will somehow have intuited these preferences and then will act uh, accordingly. Now, there are a huge number of uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns in trying to intuit what those shareholders will want um, because, as Doran has told us, you know, they may have, they may be shifting, they may have different uh, levels of, of shareholding in different companies across that sector. There's a lot of moving parts to this uh, and it makes my head spin what these, uh, you know, company 
uh, managers are supposed to be taking into account. So the nature of the allegedly anti-competitive, the antitrust uh, outcomes under version three, which is the dominant version, I think, um, the nature of them are purely structural, that these, these institutional investors hold stakes in a whole range of companies across the same sector, that they are, you know, shareholding in an oligopoly. Um, and that's irrespective of passivity. And it makes me think of a comment 101 years ago by uh, Justice Brandeis, where he said there is no such thing as an innocent shareholder. This is a model that says there is no such thing as a passive shareholder in this kind of model uh, or this kind of shareholding, and there is no such thing as an innocent shareholder. And uh, the, the scholars who take this approach have a, a quite a draconian regulatory response that they want to bring in. Um, they want divestment. There are a couple of other regulatory responses that have been brought up, limiting institutional investors to under a certain percentage, um, but they would like them to divest in all but one company in an economic sector. Not that that's always easy to work out what a particular economic sector is, but that is the regulatory uh, desire. And I think that... Um, I think that the, uh, the paper that we're looking at, uh, GGL, sorry, it says GCL there, apologies to your co-author, Gormley. Um, GGL uses versions two to get to versions three, but then some of the findings, uh, particularly in relation to index funds, I think come out at version one. All right. What has driven this common ownership debate? Well, basically, it is the changing ownership patterns that we have been seeing over the last, you know, 30, 40 years, or we've been noticing over that time. Although some legal commentators noticed it considerably earlier, um, Professor Clark, for example, uh, and, and Drucker talking about pension fund uh, socialism coming to America. There was this recognition, this concentrated ownership is coming to the US. And this is what uh, Ron Gilson and Jeff Gordon have called agency capitalism, this, you know, domination by financial intermediaries. Very prevalent in the US context, um, but not necessarily prevalent in many, in a, you know, other jurisdictions around the world. But in the US, you can see how that has risen, the institutional ownership uh, in the top 1,000 companies. Institutional ownership rose from 10% in the early 1950s to around 70% today and 80% in S&P 500 stock. Now, common ownership, of course, adds to this, this additional uh, overlay of what is the ownership in each of these companies across an economic sector. And I think that, you know, really, Doran, you and your co-authors have done an extraordinary job in really expanding this changing ownership pattern because you're, you've got this great set of data, not only 30 years for institutional investment, but also for the common ownership and also for the index fund investment. And that's, you know, really quite uh, very helpful. So the sort of US industry clusters that are examined in the common ownership literature, um, Professor Elhaug says these are the industries that are plagued with common ownership. Airlines, technology, banking, and pharmaceuticals. Um, but when you dig down and when you look at the statistics um, that he gives, not everybody has, you know, similar patterns of investment. So you see that BlackRock and Vanguard, for example, own nine out of, shares in nine out of nine of the US airlines, State Street, seven out of nine, Fidelity and T. Rowe, six out of nine. Um, and they have very different levels of shareholding. So um, as low as 1.54% for Fidelity's holding in Delta, um, and then as high as 10.7% Fidelity's holding in Spirit, uh, and BlackRock's 11.2% in Hawaiian Air, we all want to go there, and T. Rowe Price, 13.99% in American Airlines. So those percentages, um, you know, really are quite, quite different. Now, of course, as we've seen that change in the capital market structure of US uh, markets, 
we've also seen a change in the image of shareholders in corporate governance over this time. And of course, you know, the seminal Burley and Means 1932 classic text presented shareholders as this vulnerable group, uh, powerless against management and in need of legal protection. The whole idea traditionally of corporate law was to protect powerless in share shareholders. Where did institutional investors fit in that picture? Well, the traditional picture of institutional investors was really, um, you know, not great. Uh, they were measured against those vulnerable real shareholders and they were viewed as a paper colossus, alternatively greedy and mindless, but not real shareholders, according to Gulson and Krakman in 1991. But then everything changes in the 1990s with uh, recognition that institutional investors could potentially, particularly as the takeover market of the 80s slowed down, fulfill a really valuable corporate governance role as monitors. And uh, it's during this period that you get very competing narratives, I think, uh, about shareholders. This period from the rise of institutional investors and hedge funds. And I think that divergence in the narratives uh, really becomes much more dominant uh, when we get to the global financial crisis. So I've got a slide up here that we can you know, talk about later if you'd like to, where I've got, from a global perspective, many developments that I think reflect a positive view of institutional investor monitoring in corporate governance. Um, the rise of the stewardship codes around the world. Uh, and of course, the US uh, adopted one of these in 2017 with the new ISG code. Uh, this is institutional investors' self-perception. We are corporate stewards. We, we are there as a check and balance on management's power. Um, Australia has this very unusual two strikes rule in executive compensation. It's a form of say on pay, but what it does is if the remuneration report gets a negative vote of 25% or more in two consecutive years, the shareholders have the right to have a vote to remove the entire board of directors. And I was at a conference two weeks ago um, on the Asian Corporate Governance Association. Um, a a BlackRock uh, manager said to me, this has changed everything for BlackRock in Australia. This is the greatest development for institutional investors in any country we're operating. This has caused so much more dialogue between us and companies, the fear that companies could get a second strike. Um, coordinated action is encouraged by many regulators around the world. It is encouraged by uh, the Australian regulator, ASIC, and it's encouraged by the FRC in the UK. Um, it can't go into control-seeking behaviour, but if it doesn't, it is viewed as a very positive corporate governance uh, mechanism. And I think agency capitalism itself has a positive story to tell about the role of institutional investors. Jeff's right there, but you know, I see it as a positive development that these institutional investors can be a filter for uh, you know, good activism versus bad activism. They will, they will support good activism, uh, but they may tame the activists uh, if it's bad activism, according to Martin Lipton. Uh, here's a quote from Andy Haldane, who is this incredibly youthful looking Bank of England uh, economist. He certainly sees enormous benefits from institutional investor ownership. Um, he thinks that the old dispersed model of shareholding led to suboptimal decision making and that it is very important to have uh, powerful owners that can contribute to decision making. So, um, that's the positive story. In the US, however, there has been a constant stream of negative concerns about uh, activist investors. I mean, it's generally been focused on activism, whereas, as Doran's paper shows, there can be this activist passive, passive um, issue. Uh, certainly, the US shareholder empowerment debate uh, around just before the global financial crisis was very much about shareholders, if you give them stronger powers, will abuse it. And that feeds into, you know, version two of the story 
of common ownership. Um, I think common ownership goes much further uh, than the negative story of corporate governance. Um, the new goal of corporate law under the negative story is you have to protect not the shareholders, but you have to protect the company from certain shareholders, generally activist hedge funds, etc. But the common ownership debate goes further and says, no, you've got to protect entire industries from certain shareholders because the mere fact that they hold shares will result in those industries sub, you know, performing. So, some concluding comments. Who's timing me? How? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, it's just a theory, and we need to know if it if it works in practice. Because if it if it does operate in practice, there are real problems. And um, but we need to know before we put in place any regulatory responses. I think, as Doran has shown, some of the underlying presumptions in the other common ownership literature are very questionable. Now, you know, there is no doubt that institutional investors have become much more powerful in the US and been flexing their muscles with private ordering where they have changed a lot of the corporate governance rules in the US by private ordering, rules about poison pills, proxy access, uh, plurality voting, etc. cetera. Um, but are they as powerful as a lot of the common ownership scholars seem to assume they are, that management will just automatically do what they presume those owners' bidding uh, would be. And I think um, Lucian and Scott Hurst, Scott's up there, uh, and Alma Cohen have a great paper in 2017 where you have some really startling uh, statistics about how little uh, investment there is in some of the big institutions in terms of stewardship and monitoring. Um, so I think you say BlackRock um, has 24 employees to monitor 14,000 companies, Vanguard 15 employees for 13,000 companies, and State Street for 10 employees for 9,000 companies. That completely shocked me. Um, and so that I think very much feeds into your story, Doran, that you know, when they're widely spread, a lot of these companies are not paying as much attention as perhaps other common owner uh, theorists think. Um, this common ownership is not a new issue, even though those legal scholars present it as very new, that's not the case. Uh, everyone from the early 1990s knew this was on the cards. They could see institutional ownership rising. Uh, scholars such as Richard Buxbaum reached across into the German universal banking universe and said, well, maybe as institutional investors grow in America, we can use this German universal banking model uh, as our blueprint. So we, everyone knew what was happening. Also, the antitrust issues are not new. Uh, in these early 1990s papers that I cite here, uh, Buxbaum paper and Bernie Black's paper, both of them talk about antitrust. Is that um, going to be a problem for institutional investors as time goes by? And the sort of examples they give of when it would be a problem, and note the law is still the same, are very extreme. It's like you know institutional investors are arranging boycotts of a particular company. They sure don't contemplate that merely owning shares across an industry could result in breach of US um, antitrust. I've got a few more um, concluding comments, just a couple of minutes for these. The common ownership debate is all about you know, profit maximization, but is it in an individual company or across an industry? But I think you know, one thing that is becoming clear is that institutional investors and corporate managers are looking much more at ESG type issues. Um, BlackRock wrote to the top 300 CEOs in, in England uh, in 2017 and said, we will vote down your compensation increases unless you increase your employees' uh, remuneration. Now, that is completely contrary to the conclusions of the other common owner ownership scholars. They say, oh, no, this will drive down uh, employment if you have common ownership, uh, employment um, executive, non-executive remuneration. 
Also, that AMP remuneration vote that I mentioned, uh, the AMP scandal in Renee's uh, presentation, that vote was about remuneration, but it wasn't about company performance, it was about company ethics. So, this debate is very US centric. You know, a lot of these companies are competing worldwide, they're competing against state owned enterprises in China. Uh, and other huge global investors, such as the Norwegian Pension Fund, you know, they're doing the same thing. They've got 1.3% of every group listed globally. So I think some of the industries that are in the literature probably do just compete in, the, in America, but others are competing globally. So what are the consequences of the common ownership debate? If you take it literally as in the legal literature, it's, it's all over for institutional investors. And BlackRock recognises this. They've got a 2017 paper, and they say this is the end of institutional monitoring. It's the end of institutional ownership. It's the end of you know, shareholder democracy and democratisation of wealth. Um, but Doran's paper, I think, is very important because it provides some fine tuning to this rather blanket result. Um, there was a 2017 paper that was called uh, The Competitive Effects of Common Ownership. We know much less than we think. We know much more now as a result of your paper, Doran. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. I'm not sure I have a specific um, comment to that. I, might, might have, I really appreciate that. One thing I would say is... Uh, I think it's very useful for us to be able to put our paper in the context of that long debate, and that's very helpful, so we appreciate it. Yes, Maria. Um, I actually think an interesting aspect of the paper could be the endogenous matching um, between institutions and uh, or funds and companies where there's a lot of overlapping happening. Um, so, for example, it's I would you know it's one possibility is that um, institutions that tend or funds that tend to be consistently supportive of management when they vote, meaning which may be a proxy for that they're not governing very strongly, are those that tend to spread all over the place. You know, instead of having maybe ten blocks, they have no blocks and they're just kind of spread all over the companies, and that way they don't really have to govern. And you know, it's an excuse for them because you know they're just all over. Uh, so I think that's actually interesting to look at which uh, types of funds slash companies uh, are spread over. And the same thing goes for companies. Are there certain companies that tend to attract um, spread out overlapping uh, um, um, investors? For example, maybe young companies where you don't want to have a, a monitoring that's too uh, strong. Maybe those are the type of companies that attract um, overlapping, uh, uh, that overlapping um, investments. Uh, j just two more ideas, maybe look at past history of investment, maybe su successful past history, for example, of two institutions catalyzes their future investments together in other firms, maybe if they're geographically close, that also catalyzes their future investments in other things. I think all those you know, additional aspects can add more, you know, maybe some more depth to the story. Okay, so th thank you very much. Uh, it's um, uh, maybe two responses. One is, in our model and also in our framework, ownership is, is kind of exogenous, um, which I think is an interesting question to what, how ownership structure is determined, uh, thinking about common ownership, right? Um, so I think maybe that's can, can be another paper. I think it's a great suggestion to think about, uh, you know, maybe the effect of common ownership is going to be, in general, the effect of governance is going to be more pronounced when there is more implicit coordination between the investors, and that's one way to do it. I haven't read the paper, but from your exposition, it looks to me like your uh, indicator is uh, quite mechanical in the sense that uh, you assume that uh, attention by these institutional uh, investors goes down with the extent of their diversification. So almost automatically, uh, it uh, underweights hugely uh, the uh, importance of um, black rocks and that kind of investors, so that it's not surprisingly that then you get that kind of flat line which doesn't follow the behavior of the increase of the other indicators of common ownership. So it looks quite mechanical and it looks in line with the first uh, 
uh, the first view that was mentioned by the discussant of uh, institutional uh, invest of common ownership in the sense that you assume that in a way simply by being diver diversified these uh, institutional investors are not actually paying attention to any of their holdings. But as a matter of fact, if you think of the size of BlackRock, say, even if you are very, very well diversified, you have such a huge stake uh, in each of these uh, companies that you could invest a lot of attention by hiring people, monitoring uh, those stakes, because even though they are small relative to your total portfolio, is that your total portfolio is so, so huge that you know, your attention can be scaled up. Essentially, you hire more people and you, you increase your attention in absolute level. So I think, I don't know to what extent actually you take these things into account in your model, but attention is something that you can invest in. Yeah, I think this is a very important comment and definitely goes right to the heart of, of what we're doing. So when I think about it, I think about the following. Um, Let's think about an activist hedge fund like Elliott Management. They own like 10 to 15 companies. They definitely manage a few billions, not the trillions that BlackRock is managing. And I would argue they pay a lot of attention to each of these portfolio companies. At the other extreme, maybe let's think about BlackRock, where they maybe have like six tri trillion, the last time I checked, but they basically own everything. And now you tell me for a given company which investor is paying more attention. I would argue it's the Elliott Management. But I, I, I totally agree with you that the size of BlackRock, for example, right, um, is important. And there are fixed costs for acquiring information, for example, where a size can matter. But is it really matters if you own trillions or billions for this fixed cost? I, I don't know. And, and ultimately, I mean, we are putting that in the model. We think it's important, the lack of attention or inattention. Uh, we think it's correlated. There is some empirical evidence, also some theory to suggest it is correlated with how much weight a firm contributes to your portfolio. Uh, but our measure is quite flexible in terms of adding other factors if you think they are important. Is it mechanical? I don't know what exactly mechanical means, but I definitely agree with you that the effect and the difference of what our model, what our measure um, shows coming mostly from that assumption that investors pay less attention to companies which contribute less to their portfolio. Um, and maybe ultimately it's an empirical question, you know, whether that really has an effect. And this is where maybe taking the model or the measure and try to validate that and see, you know, in situations where we think externalities are really large and important, whether it has some predictive power. So this is how I would think about it. Right. So, um a comment on the last point. Uh, yours is a move the needle measure. So uh, basically, if Black BlackRock makes 10, 10 billion on an investment, it's not going to move the needle, as it were, on the six trillion total. Where a hedge fund, it would matter a lot. But but the point I want to make, really, following from what Jennifer Hill was saying, is is um, from the antitrust perspective, or the common ownership perspective, um, I mean, it seems to me uh, the risks that are even reflected in your story are less about a common business strategy than um, a common governance strategy. So, so um, uh, these these firms adopt in a local cost way, sort of a common voting pattern across all the firms that they're going to be voting on. And they observe one another's voting patterns. And so there ends up being sort of a common view, a normative view of what good governance is that is now mapped across all 6,000 firms in, the, uh, in, in what they hold. And, and it seems to me the economic risks are less from uh, the coordination in business terms than the coordination over a single governance model, which um, uh, may or may not be successful. There's a huge amount of common mode failure that seems to me to be built into uh, uh, the actions of firms that are the actions of common owners who want to uh, engage in a low-cost way in, in, quote, governance, um, which uh, maps onto a certain view as to how they think firms are going to be run, but it's not like on a firm-by-firm -firm basis they're actually following up to determine if the outputs from the governance change, which they endorse as an average matter, are going to be affecting in a positive or a negative way the given firm. And yeah. so I'm, I've been puzzled as to why that hasn't been a f more of a focus of 
uh, examination as opposed to what seems to me to be the rarefied claims of, um, of, of the, uh, uh, the consumer welfare effects of collusive activity by firms that are commonly held. I think it's an interesting angle, and um, and I think the, the way you should think about our paper is kind of we're following up on this literature, and, and basically I think this empirical literature that is emerging is is coming from this, what I refer to as an old idea where the effect, or at least how people think about the first order effect of common ownership through the business strategies or internalizing these externalities. So that's what we try to capture. doesn't mean, as you're suggesting, that maybe common ownership has other effects could be positive for different channels which don't relate to that directly. I, I agree with you. I think that there are other things one can potentially explore, but we kind of took what we think is currently is the focus of the debate and trying to have a better way or um, a way to measure um, the incentive to internalize these particular externalities. <clears throat> so if I own the same portfolio as BlackRock, obviously rescaled, uh, According to your model, we're paying the same attention mm -hmm. to each and every firm. Mm -hmm. And that's unrealistic. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I don't hold conference calls with any of, I, they wouldn't pick my, the phone and I don't have the time. Even if BlackRock only has 90 employees devoted to this, you're underestimating their attention by a factor of 90. Mm -hmm. Now, if the point of your paper is qualitative, like in the modified HHI, things rescale exactly, and that's unrealistic, attention should spread out, I think point taken, but I think the point of your paper, according to what you were trying to tell us, is quantitative. It's like, let's forget about these naive uh, indices and focus on a model-based index. Mm -hmm. And I think you're massively underestimating the attention that BlackRock, if, if the point is quantitative, you're massively underestimating. You're thinking that the brain power of BlackRock is identical to any, the brain power of anyone in the world. So, so, so there are some people from Black Oak here, so I don't want to comment on their brain power. No, I'm sorry. I will, I, mean. I will allow them to do that. I would just say, I, I, I agree with you. So in the following sense, size does matter. I'm not saying it's not matter. And I, and I think you're right. At, our current, at least the, the current version of our model kind of abstracts from that. And now the question is really what's more important. And maybe that's an empirical question. And I think our model is, uh, measure is flexible in the sense that you can also add that. Um, I would just say, I don't know, BlackRock, but maybe Vanguard, you know, I think they have 20 people or so who are monitoring the governance across this whole universe. You know, is it the first order that they are spread that um, thinly across all of these, uh, these 20 people, and uh, where, at what level is the governance is done? That's kind of what our model, our model is, is capturing. I think we want to bring that to the table, to the discussion, that attention is a first order, but I agree what we do is not necessarily perfect, and maybe there are ways to improve that, and I think that's one important dimension, so I appreciate that. So in the interest of full disclosure, I'm Matt Mallow. I'm a vice chair of BlackRock. Um, so it's an interesting discussion that, that we hear. And, and we could turn the rest of the afternoon into common ownership and a discussion of common ownership, if you wish. But I want to make just a couple of comments. Uh, first, I don't know Doran or Jennifer. I've never met them before. I, had, I have not read any of their materials or papers. Um, so I'm delighted to hear uh, at least someone in an academic context defending uh, what is, uh, from our point of view, uh, a, misappro a misapplied theory both on the, uh, the finance side of common ownership as well as on the legal side, uh, including people here, uh, here at Harvard. Um, but uh, the thing that uh, we don't tell anybody, or we don't say it loudly enough, but it does, it is in Doran's paper apparently, which is the point that you just made, that uh, we own, or Mark made, that we uh, control a very small percentage uh, of the, uh, the subjects of the common ownership of, uh, papers. So for instance, the airlines, there are four big airlines. Hawaiian Airlines is fine, and others are fine, but there are only four big airlines in the United States, uh, constitute less in the aggregate constitute less than 1% of the S&P 500 index. Less than 1%. And every uh, industry that has uh, been referenced by uh, the proponents of either the antitrust theory or the finance theory of, uh, against common ownership are all oligopolies, every single one. Now, um, if you ask any person on the street, once you tell them what an oligopoly is, 
uh, they will say, of course they don't compete. It's, it's ridiculous. Who, what oligopoly competes? And I guess what we would say is if there is an antitrust violation at the level of the airlines, because what's really being alleged is that they're fixing prices uh, when all is said and done, um, there's plenty of antitrust remedies to go after the airlines uh, and go after the malefactors, the people who are actually committing the antitrust violation. There are many other uh, issues that we can take with the common ownership papers, and this is not the place or time. Uh, but the one other thing I do want to uh, respond to is uh, we've announced that we're doubling the size of our investment stewardship group to, we're not very good at math, we're taking 31 people and making it 75, we think that's doubling. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we are going to double and, and maybe over time grow bigger, not because we think 14,000 it's not 14,000, it's actually a little bit smaller, but 14,000 companies need to be monitored, every single one. For the most part, those companies are not controversial. The pay is not controversial, the role of the board is not controversial, and we don't purport to tell companies how to run their business. We are not managers of those companies. Uh, so we really monitor about 1,500 companies a year, we are in contact with 1,500 companies a year, and they take our calls, which they wouldn't take yours. That's true. Uh, and, uh, and, and we do ask them about their boards, and what are they doing with their boards, and how are their boards supervising management. We're not telling them how to run their business. We are not managers of the business. Finally, let me say, um, we think there's a mis two misnomers that are in common parlance and I urge all of you to try to avoid them. I fall into them as well, but we should all avoid them. One is active versus passive. We are not passive investors, we're index investors. And we don't purport that we're passive. We're not activist investors. We don't nominate people for boards. We don't have shareholder proposals, but we certainly do engage. So we are engaged investors uh, and we would as pursuant to our active, uh, pursuant to our index uh, investing. The other thing is we don't own any security. Not one dollar of the securities in our index invest portfolios are ours. They're our clients. We are the asset manager on behalf of our clients. But if you listen to folks, you hear that we are the owners. Uh, and we have lots of different clients with lots of different purposes and owning lots of different types of of indices, and we're gonna talk about index in the next panel, so thank you. I'm happy also at the end of this to stick around and answer anybody's questions. I just want to make one comment um, about the size effect, which I think is important, going back to the previous comment. Um, BlackRock, for example, in our measure, it's, you know, it's true, we, because it's very diversified, they're paying not a lot of attention, but on the other hand, they do own 5% or 6% of almost every company. And therefore, they do get, because of the size effect, they do get a lot of attention from managers precisely because of that. So I just want to make sure it's clear that our measure does, I mean, BlackRock will appear quite significantly in our measure simply because they own a lot of shares in each of these companies and managers of companies care about that. But this is going to be attenuated by the fact that we think that they're paying less attention relative to more concentrated investors. That's basically what the measure is capturing. I fully agree with your view that earlier papers overstated the incentives of the large index funds to push managers in certain directions. But I think that your paper also still overstates this incentive. Um, and the reason is that there is, uh, that's correct to this paper that uh, Aunt Jennifer mentioned, we argue there that there is very substantial incentive to underinvest in overall stewardship. Mm -hmm. Now, you say you could imagine that if you have 5,000 companies, uh, you won't have that much attention, but that's actually not necessarily the case. Why? Because each of those uh, large index funds, we have the numbers in the paper, they hold more than one billion dollar positions in a significant fraction of the S&P 500. So you could imagine that each of them for one billion dollar investment might have 
from the perspective of their own beneficiary investors, it would be optimal for them to have a full-time person for each one billion dollar investment. They could afford to have a staff of 500 people. Uh, and in a VC fund or in a private equity fund, when they have an above one billion investment, they might have one or two dedicated people who focus on monitoring it. Mm -hmm. However, so it doesn't really all follow from what's the percentage of the portfolio. It also depends on what's your total investment on stewardship and monitoring. So it's a particular choice that is being made that they have a number of people, and it's great that they have 75, but if I know my arithmetics, if you divide by 75, we get that they have just one person day for each company in their portfolio. And that's for the say on pay, it's for reading the annual report, it's for talking with the company one day a year. So if you move to 75 people, you would still have just 2.5 people, uh, so, so two five person days a year. And that's really all a product of something that you don't have in the model, which is the total investment in stewardship, which we argue is kind of massively under investment for certain reasons. But that's kind of another piece that leads to the investments to push companies being arguably even smaller than what you have in your, in your presentation. No, I, I think you're echoing some of the other comments. And, 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 and I, you know, I agree with that. If we have a better measure of how much resources companies, oh, institutional investors, um, um, uh, invest in, in, in paying attention to their companies or acquiring information, I think we should use that instead of our proxy, which is basically it's a proxy, right? It's the weight in the portfolio because that's easy to observe. So uh, I should look at that paper. I'm not uh, familiar with that and see whether we can improve another dimension. So first of all, I should say that in addition to Matt, there's going to be Michelle Atkins here tomorrow. Oh, she's already here? Ah, yeah, but she's going to come tomorrow. She, she'll discuss a paper. So she's responsible for BlackRock's engagements worldwide. So you can actually ask her, you know, what they do. <laughs> um, so um, as far as uh, Standard Life Investments are concerned in the UK, which uh, Julian and I had, we actually had data from them. I can just confirm what Vincente uh, assumed. I mean, in their case, they're quite careful about, they have 800 UK stocks and they have an internal process about whom they devote attention to. So that's exactly right for them. I mean, they, they don't allocate attention in a linear fashion, but they're quite careful in, you know, um, in selecting whom they, whom they pay attention to. And it's quite endogenous, as one can imagine. Well. It's quite endogenous to size of position and trouble and, you know, whatever. At the end of the day, 75% uh, of the index investments are in the top 40 or 50 indices, and we manage 850 indices. So the sort of 80-20 rule applies here. And, and stewardship, you can talk to Michelle tomorrow. She's in charge of stewardship. Uh, basically, basically applies well. But you could, you could fairly argue we should do more. That's a reasonable position. Yeah, maybe just one comment. If, if I'm able to convince you that the attention that investors actually pay to their portfolio companies is important when we think about these externalities and effective common ownership, I think we, you know, that's, we are quite happy with that. Now, exactly how to model that, how to proxy for that, I think we can do much better. So uh, thank you for all these comments. Yeah. Thank you very much.